and we thank the Lord for blessing us to to come together once again. We thank the Lord for His goodness unto us, and we honor Him for how He watched over us and protected us all week long, and for that we are grateful unto the Lord, and we thank Him for His holy rest, His Sabbath day. We honor our Pastor Apostle James, amen, to our Lady Jan. We honor you, the people of God, whether you are on Zoom or whether you're in the sanctuary or whether you are on Facebook. We thank you for choosing to be a part of our Sabbath school. We thank God for this day. And we trust and believe and looking forward to what the Lord has for us this Sabbath. He certainly met us in a mighty way last weekend, and we praise God. Uh, for his goodness unto us. We thank God for our Deacon Preston being back with us. Amen. And we honor God for that. We thank the Lord for for how he keeps us. Um, we don't want to take that for granted. We go about our journey. We do the necessary things we need to do. And throughout the week, he blesses us to come together. And so for that, I thank God for it. So I'm going to move out of the way and turn this part of the service over into the hands of our teacher and our Apostle James Deacon Preston. And Apostle, the service is in your hands. Hey man, can you can you hear me okay, Sister Charmaine? I can. I certainly can hear you. <laughs> Good. Well, yeah. hey, I, again, I want to say happy Sabbath to everyone. I personally want to extend a great big thank you to Sister Charmaine or whoever filled in, amen, to run Sabbath school while I was away. Thank you so much for doing that and uh, definitely want to thank all of you who make a choice to engage with us. I was just sitting here getting ready for Sabbath school and what came to my mind was another day's journey and I'm so glad. <laughs> hey, Amen. We just thank God for everything that he continues to do for us. And so as we look at this lesson today, I want us to think about, and I'm going to just give context as we go into this lesson, through much tribulation. And as I was looking through the lesson, I want us to understand the Apostle Paul is preparing us as believers to understand that as we go through our walk with Christ, we are going to have tribulations. So don't think it's something that's unusual. Don't think it's something that is unique to just the, the walk that you're walking. It is something that the Apostle Paul, that Peter, that John, all of the early disciples said, listen, this is just the part of what you signed up for. And so we thank you for taking the time to engage with us. Before I jump into the content I want to share, I always want to give our Apostle Raglan an opportunity to welcome the saints. So God bless you, Apostle. Uh, thank you, Deacon Preston. Good morning to you. Good morning to our superintendent, our sister Charmaine White, <clears throat> to all those in class with us, whether you're on Zoom, Facebook Live, we, or in, here in the congregation, we thank God for all of you. Just want to say, um, great lesson, and I think it's a very timely lesson because we are in the midst, and I talked about this a week or so ago on um, our Friday night discussion, everybody talking about prosperity, prosperity, and this ministry of prosperity is is um, deceiving the saints and to think that everything going to be lovely, everything just going to be wonderful. It is wonderful because we are in Christ. But as saints of God, we are going to go through tribulation, not every day, not all the time, but because he, he gives us a reprieve. But you, you need to rest assured that once you come out of one trial or one tribulation, the chances are that he can give you a short time and then something else is going to come in your life. It may not be as, as bad as the one you just came out of, but many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord has delivered them from out of them all. Amen. And Apostle, we appreciate that. I think that's really good context for us to think about is he does deliver us out of our affliction. So as we dig into the word of God, as I, as I like to, to traditionally do, is just go through what we've got prepared. We always like to just welcome you to the house of God, where we're a Christ-centered, Bible-based church that endeavors to teach the truths of God and have a positive impact on our community by demonstrating the love of Jesus Christ. And as we think about things, I always like to just go through it. And again, I'm, I'm not going to share all slides today, but I want us to just think about uh, our three question framework that we traditionally go through as we think about studying the scriptures. And so when we think about that framework, it is really around what does it say? So what's your observation as you dig into the word of God? And then 
What does it mean? What's your interpretation as you look at the word of God? And then for me, the most important thing is what does it mean to me? What is that application that I need to have as I study the word of God? So as we think about this lesson today, if you've got your Sabbath school books, I want us to just jump right into this lesson and we're going to go through it and then we'll jump into the scriptures that we want to go through. So it is through much tribulation. Today's date is July 16th. And here's the introduction. Saul made havoc of the church entering houses and committing men and women to prison who believed on Jesus Christ. He breathed out threatening and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. Saul journeyed to Damascus with a plan and authority to bind all those of the synagogues who follow Jesus. While on his way there, his plan was interrupted when he had a personal encounter with Jesus that drastically changed his life forever. The one who once persecuted the saints would soon become the persecuted. Memory verse, Acts 14, 22, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Saul, or Paul, began preaching Jesus shortly after his conversion. As he increased in strength, he con uh, confounded the Jews, proving that Jesus is the Christ. Saul then began to encounter persecution. The Jews took counsel to kill him, and he was snuck out of Damascus under the cover of darkness. Based on his past, all the disciples at Jerusalem were afraid of him except Barnabas. At the direction of the Holy Ghost, Barnabas and Paul went on a missionary journey together. They preached Christ boldly in Antioch and Iconium. Some of the unbelieving Jews stirred up persecution against them, so they journeyed to other cities. Certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium followed them and stoned Paul, leaving him for dead. The next day, Paul rose up and left with Barnabas to Derbe. After preaching there, they were straight back to the same city, Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, that incited persecution and stoning. They confirmed the souls of the disciples and exhorted them to continue in the faith. The exhortation to the saints was that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Paul later wrote to Timothy about the persecutions and afflictions he endured. He encouraged Timothy that all that will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. We live in a society today that endeavors to silence the message of Jesus Christ. Evil men and seducers wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. In the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, we must continue to proclaim the gospel, including righteousness and holiness. Let us preach the word in season and out of season, expecting persecution and tribulation to arise. So, Apostle, before we jump into this, we look at uh, what our writer has written. What do you think from your perspective is, or one or two key things as believers, we need to walk away with to apply as we continue uh, our, our walk with God? You know, Deacon Preston, as I look at the intro to the, uh, the, biblical, uh, the biblical application, that last sentence, when, as you were reading it, um, stuck out for me in the latter part, expecting persecution and tribulation to arise. We can, as people of God, as saints of God, we cannot go through this world not anticipating that we won't, uh, thinking that we would never be persecuted, that we would never have um, tribulations. This is just part of the, of the course of being a saint, you know, and, um, and I think sometimes we don't balance that well. We think that because I'm going to be persecuted, I'm going to be beat down all the time. That's really not what it's saying, but it's letting us know that persecutions will come. I have good days. I have probably more good days than bad days. But when it comes down, and what is persecution here talking about is persecution from a spiritual aspect. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes we, we, when you teach the doctrine of Jesus Christ, when you tr teach the truths of God, um, you're going to be attacked. See, Paul um, was not attacked because of worldly th of things, that he, uh, his possessions or whatever, Paul was attacked because of his stance that he took on righteousness. 
Right. We're going to be attacked. We're going to be persecuted for our stand on righteousness. Mm -hmm. We teach a doctrine that is um, not embraced by the majority of churches. And I remember um, when I was a teenager, the persecution that those who were um, pastors and, and leaders of this congregation in those days, it was harsh. I mean, people got uh, more intellectual, the way they handle things now, but know that you are still going to be persecuted nonetheless for the word that you teach, for the doctrine you teach. You might be in the midst of very sophisticated people. They, um, but when you start talking about the truths of God, somebody going to be bold enough to attack you. That's right. the persecution That's right. I think this lesson is talking about. Amen. Amen. And so, Apostle, I appreciate that. And I think that's really a great way for us to jump into our lesson and think about what we're going to do. And so I wanted to just give a quick overview because we're going to spend some time looking at the book of Acts. And so I wanted to just talk about and lay a foundation. If you look at the book, it's called the Acts of the Apostles. So a lot of times we call it the book of Acts, but it's actually the Acts of the Apostles. And so when we look at the Acts of the Apostles, I think one of the things I always want us to take away is understanding this book. So it is actually a two-part. Uh, so typically when you study, I recommend people study the book of Luke and Acts together. They were both written by Luke, um, a, a physician. And so he does a really good job of laying out a lot of the historical details. So high level, I just wanted to talk about the book of Acts. And when you think about it, it is the only biblical book that chronicles the history of the church immediately after Jesus' ascension or when Jesus goes to heaven. As such, it provides us with a valuable account of how the church was able to grow and spread out from Jerusalem into the rest of the Roman Empire. So let's think about this. In only about 30 years, a small group of frightened believers, so let's we go back to Jesus' crucifixion. We find them on the upper room before the day of Pentecost. You've got to imagine that that 120 souls, that group of Jesus followers, have to really wonder. We thought he was going to become the king. We thought these things were going to happen. And then what really happens is he actually gets crucified. But as we watch these frightened believers in Jerusalem, they transform into an empire-wide movement of people who've committed their lives to Christ. And the book ends on a high note with Paul on the verge of taking the gospel to the highest government official in the land, the emperor of Rome. And so Acts can be neatly divided into two sections. When you look at it first, it's Acts 1 through 12. We find Peter in Jerusalem and Samaria. We, we find Peter on the day of Pentecost. We find Peter bringing in Cornelius. We find Peter doing his work. And then after that, we find Paul on his missionary journeys throughout the Roman Empire. Acts is a significant book because it chronicles the spread of the gospel, not only geographically, but culturally. So when you think about it being just in Jerusalem, this was a group of what we would call mostly Jewish believers. And as it begins to expand out, they run into people who are not Jews. They run into Gentiles. They run into Greeks. They run into different people. And so we see that in the book of Acts. It records the transition from taking the gospel from just the Jewish audience that Peter had in that upper room to going to Gentiles. And I think uh, the transition is best captured with Peter when Peter is told to take and eat. And Peter says, no, 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 uh, I don't do that. And God says, you know what? Don't call anything I've created common or unclean. So I want us to think about as we dig into the book of Acts, that we understand that. So let's go to our first scripture. Go with me to Acts chapter 9, verse 20. We're going to take a look at Acts chapter 9. Before we do that, let me just level set with this. This is going to be our anchor scripture, and I know Apostle Ragnum will love this. As I was preparing for this lesson, I want us to think about Romans 8, 28, and, and I know Apostle loves this scripture, but as I studied this scripture, so Paul writes the, the, the most of the New Testament he writes, and he has all this persecution. 
But he writes in Romans 8, 28, and we know this scripture. And he says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. As I go through some things today, I'm going to list out some of the persecution Paul lists in 2 Corinthians. So you can see him saying, you know what? I'm going through tribulation, but it's working for my good. I'm being stoned. It worked for my good. Friends walked out on me. It worked for my good. Um, some of us have gotten bad doctor's reports. It's still working for our good. We've been disappointed and discouraged. But guess what? Paul says, and we know all things are working for our good. So, Apostle, before I jump into Acts chapter 9, anything you want to say about that? Because I know that Romans 8 is one of your favorites. And I think we uh, it's my favorite because... The thing that we go through, the persecution that we go through, the tribulations that we go through, if as people of God, if we don't keep it in the back of our mind, this thing I'm going through is pretty hard, but I got to always keep in my mind, this, but it's working for my good. And I think so many times people miss that. And even when I'm counseling people or talking to them about the things that they are enduring, one of the things that I always share with them is that, yes, you're going through but don't you realize this is really working for your good? Amen. Amen. So let's jump to Acts chapter 9. As you think about digging into this scripture, go to Acts chapter 9. And we're actually going to look at verse 20 through 29. And I want us to take a look at this. It's Acts chapter 9, 20 through 29. And this is what it says. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them, which called on this name in Jerusalem, and came hither from, for that intent, that he might bring them bound unto the chief priest? But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. And after that, many days were fulfilled. The Jews took counsel to kill him, but their laying, but their laying away was known of Saul, and they watched the gate day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night, and led him down by the wall in a basket. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. So apostle, as I look at the scripture, and I want to just pull some things out for the saints that when we think about uh, the apostle Paul, this transformation. So some of you may remember it is the Apostle Paul who is actually there when Stephen is stoned. Uh, you see him, that the coats are actually thrown down at his feet, and he is known as a terror. Uh, Paul has no problem uh, rounding people up, persecuting people. Um, people know him. He has a reputation for being a person who uh, is not for this Jesus movement. And as I was preparing for this lesson in Apostle, one of the things that stood out to me, Paul looked at the Jesus movement as a form of idolatry. And because he knew Israel's history so richly, he said, listen, idolatry has always gotten us in trouble. I need to squash this movement now. And that's what he was doing. But as we look at his personal encounter with Jesus Christ, it is after this encounter that he becomes bold, he preaches, but he's got all these people who are trying to kill him. So my question to you, Apostle, is, as I look at the scripture, Paul really never overcame his own prior reputation. So how do we overcome our past reputation as we move forward and still might get persecuted? 
You know, Digga Press, that's a good question. But the thing is, <clears throat> we cannot stop the work to try to convince somebody as to who we are. Mm. You know, we, we, we run across um, people who have been fighters, who fight the commandments. They fight a lot of things. And then when God opened their understanding to it, and they profess that, I see it, sometimes we too are a little apprehensive. You know, uh, are they really there? Do they really believe it? Because um, it's kind of funny, but if people don't come and grow up, grow up with us, go through these things with us, we, we are not so quick to believe them, especially when they used to fight us. You know, I've had preachers that I know were fighters, right? And then they want to invite me to preach for them. I'm going, okay. I mean, I'll come, but in the back of my mind, but you fight when I teach. And you know me enough to know that if I preach, I'm not going to just come in and attack you, but whatever comes up in the message is going to come out. But, you know, so you, then you wonder, what is the goal? What is, what is your purpose? And we have to be like Paul. You have to keep pushing. You got to push through because if we stop and, and chase everything that folks say about us, we would never get the work of Christ done. Yeah, Apostle, I love that point, and I'm going to open it up to the class. So one of the things I heard you say, um, regardless of what people are thinking, we still have to keep pushing. And I think that's the thing. As you look at this scripture in Acts chapter 9, you see the word boldly is used several times that even though Paul, the people were plotting against Paul, people were saying he had not changed, people were bringing up his past. He kept moving boldly. He kept moving boldly. So I want to open it up to the class. What can sometimes stop us or hinder us from moving boldly in Christ? So come off mute, put it in the chat, uh, put it on Facebook. What are some of the things that could stop us from moving boldly in Christ? Because we see this example through the Apostle Paul that through much persecution, he kept moving boldly. So I want to open it up for the class to get some comments on that piece. Any thoughts on that? What would stop us from moving boldly in Christ? We got a hand in the sanctuary. Yes, um, Brother John. All right. She bring you the mic. Is it on? No. All right. I'm, I'm getting some things on Facebook. Let, let Brother John, uh, I think we had a little mic issue. All right. We're going to get Brother right John. Down. Go ahead, Brother John. <laughs> Hold on, Dick and Preston. We're trying to. All right, we're going to wait a minute. We switching mics. I'm sorry, Dick and Preston. No, that's fine. That's fine. Is he, as we're switching mics, one of the comments I got from Facebook from um, someone, they said insecurity may be the thing that actually stops us from moving boldly. And so I, I love that comment, that thought. What could stop us from moving boldly? And someone's comment was insecurity. So is Brother John ready, Apostle? I think he is. Let's see. Go right. ahead. Go ahead, Brother John. Yeah, he got it. You will stop in the beginning if you would. All right. And sometimes you don't understand there will be persecution that will stop you out. As a young man, I had a job where I was always assigned. Excuse, excuse me, Apostle. We can't hear him. You can't hear him? Um, mm -hmm. uh, where, where are we, Sister Rhonda? As, as a young man, I was assigned every day as a helper to a... Uh, what they call a top grade cabinet maker. And at that time, I told everybody about Jesus and the scripture. And he hated it. He would actually tell me, man, will you just shut up? He didn't <laughs> want to hear it. But I kept on. That went on for three years. 
And I mean, I was intimidated, but I was going to tell him. And so I got transferred to another place. And it was about three years later, I got a call at 11 at night. And he said, is this John? John Goodwin, you used to work at GSA? I said, yeah. He said, this is Ronald. Ronald Powell. It's 11 at night now. My kids are in the bed. And I said, hey, how you been? He said, I just wanted to let you know that I accepted Jesus Christ as my wow. Savior. All right. <laughs> and uh, so, and then he invited me over, and I went to his church. So you got to keep on, like Apostle That's it. says, yeah. even though it's intimidating, but you have to keep on. That's true. He said, yeah. he was just, you, Shannon, you heard him or not, but he was talking about how intimidation can stop you. But what he was saying, I kept pushing, I kept teaching. This. Um, Sister Edith, go ahead. And sometimes fear can keep you from doing what you right. Yes, right. To do. It, we, fear is a big, a big one. Go ahead, Deacon Preston. Yeah, and I think that's a good point that they bring up. I think uh, our brother John and Sister Edith, uh, our evangelist Devon Frazier said the same thing. It's fear. So we've got fear. We've got insecurity. Uh, Sister Furlow says, like Paul, the fact that we have a poor reputation may prevent us from moving forward boldly. We may not feel like we have any credibility, despite the fact that we have an earnest transformation of the mind. Everybody has a past, and the enemy will often surface it as a strategy to keep you quiet for fear that the shame attached to your past. So, Sister Furl, I, I appreciate you bringing that up. I think the great thing that the Apostle Paul was able to do was one, yes, I was who they say I was. He has this recognition of this, uh, my history is my history, but he does a great job of moving on from that history. So Sister Furl, I thank you for sharing that. I see another comment we've got from Deacon Desmond Fain. He says, Saul is a classic example of how misplaced zeal often leads to persecution. Saul committed atrocities against the saints while genuinely believing that what he was doing was in conjunction with the will of God. We find examples of this from those who were suicide bombed themselves and harm others uh, in the name of God. And so Deacon Fain, I love that point. I think that is so important that we uh, that you brought that piece up. So as we think about this piece, as we go through what the Apostle Paul shares, you're going to watch him go through much persecution. But in the reality, nothing stops him from moving forward. So uh, Apostle, any comments you've got before I get to our uh, Russell West has his hand up. Oh, okay. I wanted to see if you had any comment. I do. I just want to make this statement. You know, we can be in the presence of somebody when they receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. But if that person had a colorful past, seemingly we don't mind them receiving the Holy Ghost. We just don't want them to preach and teach. Mm. Think about it. You know, we we okay with them, but thank God you're saved now. But when the Lord wants to use them, the saints of God want to bring up their past. And we cannot do that. And, and, and um, we can't shut down on people just because of what they used to be. And like you were saying earlier, Dick and Preston, everybody have a past. Not right. all of them are colorful. Not all of them, you know, maybe it's lewd or whatever else. But the thing is, we were all born in sin. And, and now we have to recognize that this person is now called of the Lord. We, mm -hmm. want, we want God to get our okay to call somebody. But, Lord, why are mm -hmm. you calling that one? You know what they used to do? He's, I'm God. You ain't God. I set up who I want to set up. Go ahead, Deacon Preston. Yeah, but I think that's a I think that's a good point. And I think this is why I love the scripture. I believe the scripture captures even the apostles in Jerusalem were worried about Paul. His reputation preceded him, but it's over time that they build relationship with him. They watch his work, they see what he's doing, and they say, you know what, Paul is truly an apostle and a brother of ours. And so we get to see this human dynamic play out in the church, but again, they all move forward with the gospel, and I think that's really important. So I want to take uh, Russell West. I see that your hand up. Go ahead. Go ahead, Brother West. <clears throat> I don't think uh, we fear because we don't wait on the Holy Ghost. Paul 
wasn't afraid because he was sent by the Holy Ghost. Mm. He was qualified and sent, and he waited to be sent by the Holy Ghost. A lot of times we get we get zeals, but mm. we don't wait for the Holy Ghost to send us, or we don't wow. wait for instruction from leaders. So that's a lot of times where we mess up because we don't have the go ahead from the Holy Ghost. And a lot of times the people in the church see that. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Uh, I love that point. I love that point, Brother West. I think that's a good point. And we think about Paul zeal, but he was sent by the Holy Ghost to do this work. So I think it's important as we dig into the scripture. So one of the things I, I want to touch on, if we don't have any more comments, as we look at the word of God, uh, I want to look at actually, I'm going to go to Acts chapter 13, 13 through 18. And then we're going to take a look at some of the things that the apostle Paul went through. So let's take a look at Acts chapter 13, 13 through 18. And we'll watch what Paul says. As Luke writes this, he says, Now when Paul and his company loosed in Paphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any words of exhortation for the people, say on. Then Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand said, Men of Israel, and ye that fear God, give audience. The God of the people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt, and with a high arm brought him them out of it. And about the time of 40 years suffered he their manners in the wilderness. So Paul begins to continue. He goes to synagogues. And whenever he's given a chance to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ, he stands boldly and preaches and he ministers the word of God. And if you keep reading Acts chapter 13 into uh, chapter 14, we're going to see some of the things that actually happened to Paul. So we're going to go to Acts chapter, if we go to Acts chapter 13, and we go through, um, actually, this is Acts chapter 14 or 13, going through 42, all the way down to 51. I want to read this to you. He says this. So this is actually Acts chapter 13, 42, uh, and I'm taking it down to 52. And I want us to watch what happens here. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now, when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes that were filled with envy, they spake against those things that were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold. You hear that word so much as we look at Paul. They waxed bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. Lo, we turn to the Gentiles, for so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light unto the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region, but the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable men and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coast. But they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came unto the Iconium and disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. So apostle, I want to ask you the question. What do you do? And I'm, I'm asking this to you from a pastor standpoint. How do you deal with uh, when people 
don't agree with what you preach and you're trying to do the right thing and you're continuing to try and do the right thing, how do we continue to deal with that? This persecution that Paul was experiencing from his own brothers and sisters, how do we deal with that? You know, good question, Dick Compressor, but this is the thing. Paul was preaching, and who was he preaching to initially? To Jews. That's right. Paul did not understand his assignment. It's only in verse 47 when Paul's assignment is made clear to him. Mm. It's 47 said, for so has the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou should be for salvation unto the end of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad, glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were ordained to enter in, into life believed. He was trying, because, because he was the persecutor of the Jews and uh, the the the, the uh, religious Jews, if you would, uh, a persecutor of those that believe Christ, believe in Christ. He was a supportive of the Jews that fought against Christ. So when he began, when he was, uh, when God changed him, he's trying to preach to those same ones that he was a part of. And the Lord said, that's not your assignment. So when we are preaching to people um, and talking to people, in the back of our mind, we always got to know, what is my assignment? Good. You know, I pastor a church, and that's part of my assignment. There are going to be people in the church that are going to support you. There are people in, in the, your church going to be your right hand. And there are other people that's going to go along or come out, do what they do. But you may never have that full support. But you have to know what your assignment is, that you don't stop what, what God has given you to do to try to convince them. Okay. So, Apostle, as we talk through this lesson through much tribulation, how do you, and, and again, how do we deal with the discouragement that will come with tribulation? Because one of the things, and we'll talk about this as we get to uh, 2 Timothy, but I want to frame it from the standpoint, because I'm going to share some things in 2 Corinthians. How do we deal with from, from a past, your pastoral lens, and I'll open up to the, this to the class, how do we deal with the discouragement when we're persecuted, uh, when we're shunned, uh, as we begin to share and actually model Christ? The way we deal with it is we, ha we, uh, we have an expected end. And if I allow things that people say and do to prevent me from completing my assignment, I'm not going to get the expected end. So these things are about light afflictions what people say and what they do and how they work against you. And, uh, you know, uh, church uh, and, and people go through waves. You know, uh, sometimes look like everybody's on the same bandwagon, but God began to break up that stuff. And then gradually people see what you're trying to do and then they begin to support you. But you can't wait to do what God has given you to do for everybody to get on board. Amen. Those that love, love the that. Lord that are, are operating from a place of misunderstanding or from a place of ignorance, they will come to understand. Those that are just um, working with their father, the devil, even though they're in the church, they're going to still do it. And you see it, you know it, and God give you wisdom as to how to deal with it. Amen. Amen. I see Sister Furlow. I'm going to ask you to come off mute. You said, Paul reminds me of Ezekiel that it was like fire shut up in his bones. He couldn't help but preach Jesus. So talk to me, Evangelist Furlow. Why, why do you say that? You, you say that Paul just couldn't help himself. Well, I mean, once he had that encounter with the Holy Ghost, it, you, there was no going back after that. He had to do what thus saith the Lord. He was compelled. Yes. He had to preach the gospel. Woe was him if he preached not the gospel. And so he did it with such passion and such conviction and such earnestness because it was, as I think um, the first brother, um, Brother West said, the Holy Ghost was moving him to do what he did. And so he was obedient unto the Holy Spirit and he did what he had to do. And I was just saying, my other comment was in relation to how do pastors and other leaders deal with that. I said, like David, sometimes you got to encourage yourself. You know that you're going to come up against the enemy and you just have to continue to encourage yourself through it, knowing that you're doing the will of God. 
Hey Amen. I love that point. So let's just jump. I want to just share something. This isn't in our Sabbath school lesson, but as I was preparing for the lesson, I want you to go to 2 Corinthians. So go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And as we take a look at this, as I was looking at this lesson, I just thought, man, what did Paul go through? And in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he's actually uh, dealing with some false prophets. And, and he just says, you know, I just want to share with you what I've experienced. And as we think about our own tribulation, as we think about uh, our own persecution, as we think about our own disappointments, that's why I wanted us to anchor in Romans 8.28 that is working for our good. So, so look what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians as people are talking to him about, who are you really, Paul? Paul says this. He said, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? <laughs> I am out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I've worked much harder. I've been in prison more frequently. I've been flogged more severely and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open ocean. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at, at the sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face the da daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak? And I do not feel weak. Who is led into sin? And I do not inwardly burn. If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of Lord Jesus Christ, who is to be praised forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the governor under King Aretas had the city of the Demisians guarded in order to arrest me. But I was lowered in a basket from a window in the wall and slipped through their hand. So, Apostle, as I read this, as I think about his persecution and through much tribulation, what comes to your mind is, is Paul lists out, listen, if y'all want to see somebody persecuted, uh, or, or going through tribulation, I'm just going to give you a smidgen of some of the things I've gone through. What do we take away from that as believers? I think one of the things we take, have to look at is that many times we talk about Paul's testimony and the testimony of his conversion. But here in um, 2 Corinthians, he is to, he's given a testimony, but he's given a testimony of what he had gone through, the struggle. And, you know, we don't always tell. But every once in a while, mm. when people don't think you've done anything, people don't think you've been through anything because of the way you handle it. See, Paul, you said all the, uh, earlier, Paul kept moving. Paul was yeah. very bold in what he was doing. But because he was bold and because he kept moving, it did not stop people uh, from persecuting him. It did not stop him from having to go through things. So every once in a while, and nothing wrong with it, you know, not something we, we talk about daily, not something we talk about um, that often. But every once in a while, you got to tell your story. Mm. Got every, nothing wrong with telling your story every once like in a while. That. Look, I'm not boasting. I'm not bragging. I'm not saying that um, I was, uh, I suffered more than anybody else. But y'all think my life has been easy? Let me share some of my experiences. And I think he does it. And I love, what version were you reading, Digger? I, I, that was the um, the Holman Christian Bible, or it, oh, no, yeah. it was the um, is these a Holman or New English Christian okay. Bible that I read I from? Have, yeah, I have them. But the thing is, I like the way it's now. I, I, as you were reading it, I was going along in King James, and I like the version that you were reading because to me that tells the story, the same words, the same thing, but that 
that particular, um, we can understand the suffering that he went through and had gone through in his life. And guess what? What we're reading in, in um, Second Corinthians is not even the end of the story. That's right. <laughs> That's right. He got Ed, I, He knew he was going through even more, but he said, let me just take a moment in time and share with you all what I've been through. And you know, when sometimes people hear somebody's story, their mouth fly open, they go, ah, oh, I didn't know that about you. I didn't know you had gone through that much. So nothing wrong with telling it. Hey Amen. I love that. And so I, I see Sister Stephanie Christmas put something out I wanted to share. She says, even when we are discouraged, we have to remember it's about Jesus, not about us. And so I love that point. And so I want to just open it up to the class. I want to have some engagement uh, as we think about what Paul shared right there, all the things I've gone through. So as you think about the things, the tribulations that you've personally experienced, the trial by fire that you've had, what, what word of encouragement would you give somebody that's going through tribulation right now? How is it that you manage your tribulation or your trial and you are still with God? So come off mute, put it in the chat on Zoom or put it in Facebook. How have you navigated your own tribulation? Because we see Paul going through and we see him continuing to move forward. But I want to hear from the saints. How have you navigated and moved forward in your tribulation? So I'm going to uh, allow you to just jump in, come off mute, and if you want to share, more than welcome to share. Any comments? You say what, Brother John? He said you navigate by keep going. Okay. Yes. Brother, Brother John keep. says you navigate by you you keep going. What else? Brother Keith has a, a, something he wants to share. Stand on the word of God, Psalms 23, where he says, never leave me nor forsake me. He knows uh, with me always, even till the end. That's right. He did say he'll never leave us. He won't forsake us. He'll be with us always, even to the end. Somebody else. I'd like to add something. Um, I've seen, and I'm still learning how vital it is to have the Holy Ghost and mm. the fruit of the Spirit operating you know, all the, the characteristics of it, because I need patience or, or long suffering. I need the faith, the fruit of um, faith, the, the spirit of love. I need, I need all of it operating. So <laughs> making sure that the spirit of God is indeed abiding within. That's right. Sister, I, I love that sister. point that Sister Sean may, may makes is that I go through and I continue to move forward because I, I'm the fruits of the spirit. So I continue to model the fruits of the spirit. So Sister Charmaine, thank you for sharing that. I see Sister Furlow, and then we've got either Vic or Monica. So Sister Furlow, go right ahead, and, and then we'll get Vic and Monica. Have, uh, Sister Edith. I, okay. I was, I was just thinking about one of the lessons that we had recently where Apostle talked to us about joy, how important it is for us to have joy, even mm. in the midst of stuff. And so I think that the joy that we continue to have, despite having gone through difficult times, is what messages to the unbeliever that somehow you can have hardship, adversity, difficult circumstances, but you still come out with joy. And that is so amazing to them because the expectation is the opposite, that we would be discouraged and downcast, and so just exuding joy in the midst of our sorrow, in the midst of what it is that we're going through, I think, is a testimony in and of itself about the effectiveness and power of God. So, Sister Furl, I want to just ask on that, because I think that's a good point, is modeling joy as we go through tribulation. Why is that important for people to see us do that as believers? Well, let me just, I think it makes a Because distinction. of Romans 8, 28. I think that's right. Sorry, because it goes back to mm -hmm. Romans 8, 28, that in all things, you know, that we know that it's working together for our good. It, that doesn't mean that it feels good, but it is ultimately it is going to work out for our good. Yeah, I, I love that. And I see a comment from Sister Mitchie. She says the world needs to see saints holding on. Yeah. And I love that comment. Um, sometimes the only word, the only Bible, the only thing people will see that will model Jesus will be us. And so, Sister Mitch, I love that point. The world needs to see us. When we go through uh, where most people would buckle, where most people would turn around and walk away, the world needs to see us 
keep moving forward and holding on. And I love the point that we are, we're going through so people know that God is real. So Apostle, anything you want to share before I get Victor or Monica? I'll go right ahead with them. All right, Victor, Monica, come off mute and share what you've got. I just wanted to say that we have to really trust God, that even though the situations that we are going through and the hardships or disappointments or whatever life throws at us, we just really got to stand on God's word and just say, God, I trust you. I don't care what this stuff looks like. I got to trust you. I don't have a choice. If I'm in Christ, I don't have a choice. I actually have to trust God and wait for him to bring deliverance to me, to wait for him to bring me out. I got to trust him. I just got to trust him. Mm. Situations can look bad, but I got to trust him because he said he'd never leave me nor forsake me. So I got to hang in there when things get tough. But but I'm, my, Sister Monica, I'm tired of hanging in there. When am I going to get some relief? When, when am I going? When is when is the tribulation going to stop? It doesn't matter. Okay. It doesn't matter how long it takes. It doesn't matter how long it takes. We still got to hang in there. So, That's wait, right. Um, uh, Sarah, so waited how many years did they wait for children? I mean, we, you know, but God had promised them. And if he promised us that he would never leave us nor forsake us, did he, if he promised us that he was our keeper, if he promised us that he was our deliverer, if he promised us that he was our strong tower, you know, I got to hang in there. Yes, I can cry while I'm going along. Mm. I know, I know Evangelist to me said yes with joy, but if I got to cry while I'm going along, let me cry. Because God knows and just hang in there with him. Amen. Amen. Oh, my, my mama was saying her lifetime, time not, and hold on. That's right. That's right. I, you know, Sister Charmaine, she would say that time not and hold on. Or you know what? Sometimes you just got to scotch the wheel and mark time because you never know what God's going to do. Sister Monica, I loved your point. Sometimes you got to cry while going along. And you know what? And, and I love that nugget that you gave us. I see Sister Devon Frazier. Go right ahead. I see your hand is raised. Um, yes. I just wanted to mention as you were talking and, um, referring to joy. Um, sometimes we mix up what joy is versus what happiness is. Mm. Nobody said that it was going to be um, happy times all the time. Your life was not going to be scot-free. Um, we are instructed in the New Testament that offenses are going to come. Yep. And we're sometimes we weigh that as, okay, I see the offenses, but this looked like some kind of uh, more than a season. It looks like it's going past uh, fall and summertime. Uh, I'm, I'm, we, we coming into the harvest time and I'm still going through this thing. Right, right. But have you budged? Have you made the, the certain sacrament or a sacrifice that God is requiring um, from this incident? If you have not changed, if nothing has if, if nothing has been resolved, if nothing has um, shifted, then you're going to continue to go through and not only that, maybe go through it over and over again. Mm -hmm. So there has to be some kind of like uh, 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 Deacon West said um, mm -hmm. that you have to allow the Holy Spirit to do it and take you through it because joy, joy will allow you to to go through it to go through it with long suffering and say you know i i know i'm going through this but god there must be some kind of message in this there must be something you're trying to tell me or there, there's something that you're trying to pull something out of me that i have i have fear to go into the unknown mm. so make it known to me father what i need to see so i don't have to die in the suffering so i don't have to be persecuted so 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 often and that that you know the the faith is that he will take you through and the other thing that i wanted to bring up there are many that will that that say that i will never go over the threshold into the church and because we are epistles being seen and read of men they are they are looking at our lives i have been in many workplaces 
that I have had some taskmasters. Oh my gosh, on the work on on the on in 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 my workplace, and I just have to go in there with the mindset that Father, you gave me this job for a reason. I'm here on assignment, and until the assignment is complete, that's it. I don't care what it looks like, pink slips, uh, red notices, the side eye, no matter what. Father, you have me here for a reason. You know, I want to add to what Sister Vaughn was saying. She was talking about happiness. Happiness or happy is not a fruit of the spirit, but joy is. Mm. Yes. I like that. <laughs> I like that, Apostle. I want to read some of the comments. I appreciate your engagement. Uh, Kathy Washington says, I set my face as flint and I keep on going, trusting with love and knowing that Jesus is with me and he will see me through. Sister Brenda Bishop said, there is joy in the midst of your tribulation. Uh, Sister Zelda says, uh, amen, Sister Monica, very encouraging, trusting God to get me through so I can have a testimony, uh, so I can have a testimony that's going to help others. Uh, and so uh, put your armor on, Sister Mitchie, and prepare for, for a fight. God didn't take you to it, not to bring you through it. He promised that he would never put more on us than we can handle. And I'll say this, when people were talking, I thought about the song, nobody told me. The road would be easy, but I don't believe he brought me this far to lead me. So we thank God for your engagement. I see, Apostle, you got your hand up. Yeah, uh, Can sister, I? Uh, sister Edith, if you have a comment. Oh, yes. Okay. I'm, I'm thinking about the joy of the Lord is, is my strength. And I'm also thinking about there was a brother that once said, you can be discouraged, um, but don't, um, you know, don't give up hope. And I thank the Lord for this because truly, glory God, I re really love to pray. And I realized the only way that I have gone through, it took much, much prayer and trusting the Lord. Because truly, as um, Apostle would say, um, all things work for good for them that love him. And th that according to the purpose of, uh, purpose of the Lord. And it's just, just wonderful. And I remember something else he said, um, and I think about a lot of the things he's already said to us from time to time is that in um, your suffering, remember, there's a reward. Jesus had the reward after he had suffered to go back and be with his father in glory. And so when we think about these little things and add them up, because I, I went back and listed all the little things that pastor has said. And I want to keep them before me because truly, glory to God, it's a joy in serving the Lord. Um, oh, we might go Praise through him. a lot, but when I stop to think of what Jesus went through, my lot is not anything at all. And so I always think when he was hanging on that cross for nine hours, and we can't go through nothing hardly any bit, but um, those nine hours, how many of us would want to go through? None of us. So we thank and praise God for the teaching of the word of God and it being plainly taught to us that we could just grab hold of, if it's only a little bit, and hold on to it that we may grow. And it's just, it's just wonderful because we have to hold on to the Lord. That's all we got. Amen. Praise the, okay, praise the Lord. This is Sister Turner. May I say something? Yeah, bless you, Sister Turner. Good to hear your voice. Thank you. It's a blessing to be here. I, I, I want to uh, join in with the other ladies and men that were speaking about trusting and obeying God. We, we realize, we must realize that the same God that's on the mountaintop is the same God that's going to bring us through that valley. And the God in the daylight is the mm. same God at night. The God of the good times Mm. He's the same God of the bad time. He is God and he won't change, but right, he so will see us through <laughs> if we trust him. And we realize we got to go through something. It's okay. how we go through it, mm. how to go, our mentality, you know, how we go through it that's going to please him. But we've got to be ready to go through. You know, Paul said, I, I, I fought a good fight. That's right. You know, he finished the faith. He kept the faith. He, 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 he endured hardship. That I cannot endure, I know, but I know God will not put more on me than I can bear. But He's the same God 
that will see us through that valley experience. In Jesus' name, thank you. Amen. Amen. Love, Amen. love that, Sister Turner. Go ahead, Apostle. No, I was just thinking that. Yes, Cohen was Brother Sister Victor. Turner was um, I, I like everything that's been said by the saints. It's very good. But it, it, it was brought to my, to my spirit a, a little while back that uh, I think a lot of us get hung up on uh, weeping in due for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Yes, sir. He didn't say what morning. That's right. <laughs> that, 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 that's, what, that's what's wrong with that. that. He didn't say what morning because we think we're going to weep, weep, weep a little bit at night and joy won't come in the morning, but he didn't say what morning. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I love, I love I just, that, Brother Victor. I just wanted to drop that in, you know. <laughs> I appreciate that. I'm going to read one more comment, then we're going to jump to our next scripture. Sister Brenda Bishop said, we proclaim trust and faith, but without trials, how do we know? How do we know? So again, I appreciate your engagement and, and your words of encouragement. As I think I was listening to people, uh, I love what Apostle said. Sometimes you just got to go back and share it because the sharing of those things can help somebody else. Uh, the sharing of our testimonies, what we've gone through, uh, just words of encouragement help us go through, amen. So let's let's go to our next scripture. We got two more, and then we're going to wrap up Second uh, Timothy chapter three. So if you got your Bibles, go to Second Timothy chapter three, and we want to just take. We're going to go through verses one through nine first. Then we'll take a look at the others. As Paul is writing to this young man, Timothy, um, he's really trying to help him understand some things that go on. And so we'll go to 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 9 first, then we'll finish it up. And he says, Paul writes this. He said, this know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness. And Apostle, I'm going to ask you to touch on that but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sin, led away with divers' lust, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. And men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith but they shall proceed no further for their folly shall be manifest and to all men as theirs also was. So apostle, I want to just stop there as we engage with this scripture. And Paul writes this a hundred of years ago. He sees this even in his period of time. But if I, as I read that preparing for the lesson, it seems like that's where we are today. So, but I want you to, this ever learning, but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. Uh, help us understand that. This is the thing. This scripture is talking about church folk. Mm. Verse 5 said, having a form of godliness, that's church folk. Wow. That's not the world. All these things that have been described here, high mind, the lovers of pleasure, more the lovers of God, um, um, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despise of those that... Uh, Listen, everything from one through nine one through, is talking about church folk. Mm -hmm. We read this scripture, we think it's talking about the world. It ain't talking about the world. You, your church membership, even your church attendance does not make you uh, having the knowledge. He said you, you will make, not make you acting according to the knowledge because he says here, you never come you never come to the truth. You hear mm -hmm. it. You attend service. You do all. You go through all the motions of church, but you never come to it. But you. But then, oh, that's a good Christian. 
That's a good thing. They're in church every week. They're doing this, that, and the other. Really? No, 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 no. You have a form of godliness, Mm. but you're not denying the power that you should have if you were godly. Well, Apostle, all right, so I I need you to to help us get a deeper understanding of that because Paul lists that piece with all the other things. So all the other things are things that I would say, well, that's not a believer. That's not a church follower. But then you say this ever learning but never coming to the knowledge of the truth, that's church folks. That's all of it. Wow. Okay. All of it. Even even from the very beginning of what he's saying in in this chapter, starting down from verse one on down. He is talking about church folk are doing these things. We know mm. the world's going to do it. The world's expected to do this. That's what. That's how the world conduct themselves. But it's a sad commentary when it occurs and when it happens at church or with church folk. Okay. All right. You, you you're the one that that have the form of godliness. You know, you dress the part. You talk the part. You even look. You know, you look the part. And you try to play the part, but you don't live the part. Mm. So I can I can play the part, but I I not live the part. Um, and so I appreciate that nugget that you're bringing out. And as we close up, we may we may touch on that point as we wrap up. So we see this thing in in Second Timothy uh, these first nine verses. So let's go to the next verses and see what Paul says because we have this thing that Paul mentions. He's like, Timothy, you need to be aware of this. And Apostle, I appreciate your insight. He's talking about church folks. So let's see what he says next as we think about the next verses, 10 through 17. So Paul says to Timothy, but thou hast fully known my doctrine, my manner of life, purpose, my faith, my long suffering, my charity, my patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, for persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and has been assured of knowing of whom thou has learned them and that from a child thou has known the Holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise into salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished, unto all good work. So, Apostle, I look at 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 9. Paul lists these things that, Timothy, you need to be aware of. And then he transitions in the verse 10 and says, hey, but Timothy, you know my doctrine. You know my life. You know my purpose. You've seen all these things. And then he says in verse 12, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And then he says, Verse 14, but continue thou in these things. So talk to us about that, Apostle, when we think about the believers, that he said, you're going to serve a persecution, but I need you to continue. Well, Paul is saying, there's a lifestyle out there, out here that churchgoers have. He said, but uh, Paul is saying to Timothy, but you know my doctrine. Mm. You know the word. You you know, you, you came up with good instruction. Your mother, your grandmother, they taught you. So you know all of this. Now, you got a choice. You can live by my example, by mm. uh, my manner of life, my purpose, my faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecution. You see all this in me. You can live that way and please God, or you can do what I just talked about in verses 1 through 9. <laughs> Having that form of God. He said, look, you can't be Um, Timothy, you can't be a minister of God because here's the elder minister talking to the younger minister. He said, you can't be this minister of God if you want to do everything else. Mm. You got to know the doctrine, you know the word, and you got to live this thing. And living it is going to come with persecution. 
Wow. Wow. I like that, Apostle. That's good clarity on that. Again, as Paul is writing to Timothy and he shares this part, especially around the church, and I don't know if I've ever looked at it like that, that he was actually talking to uh, people who were in the church. And I love how you broke that down. He's like, Timothy, you really got a choice. You can do what you see in verses one through nine, or you've seen my example and you can follow that example. And it may, as you were talking, it made me think, uh, I hear this pastor say all the time, more is caught than taught. So he's caught, he has caught uh, Paul living the life. He has watched Paul in his persecution. And so he sees somebody who actually is not only talking the talk, but he's actually walking the walk. And I think that's important for us as we go through in our life today. Yeah, well, you're saying you got people in church that will that are pleased, lovers of themselves. They're pleased that what they do is going to please themselves rather than living a life for the Lord. That's right. But they're That's good right. church folk. All right, we're going to finish up with 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 8. And as we think about, hopefully you've been encouraged. If you're going through a trial or tribulation or a persecution, I think you've heard some things that hopefully will help you continue to simply hold on. And so as we finish up with 2 Timothy, very familiar passage of scripture, 4, 1 through 8, this is what Paul writes. As Paul is writing, now here's the thing, as Paul writes this, he understands what his end is going to be. And I want us to think about that. Understanding. All of the disciples, except for the disciple John or the apostle John, was martyred. And even though Paul was not one of the 12, he was one of the apostles. But he understands, I am going to lose my life for the gospel. But he writes to Timothy and he says this, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of our ministry, for I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. So hopefully you get encouraged as Paul is writing to Timothy and he just says, listen, I'm getting ready to be offered up. I know I'm going to lose my life. I know what I've gone through. But here's the thing I want you to understand. He says, you know what? I fought my fight. I finished my course and I've kept the faith. And so I think about some of the things that someone has shared. You might have to cry as you go through the journey, but keep on walking. Uh, you may just have to, you know, model joy, keep on walking. I heard Apostle Daly preach the message once in Cobham. His message was keep walking. He said, just keep walking. And I think that's important for us to understand uh, that we go through and we're going to go through persecution. So, Apostle, as we get ready to wrap up this lesson, uh, any comments you want to share? And I asked the class. What did you hear today that they left you with some encouragement? Because we're going to go through tribulation, but I also want us to leave encouraged that God will also take us through. So put it in the chat, put it on Zoom in the chat. You can come off mute and share it. But Apostle, anything you want to leave us with as we leave this lesson through much persecution? You know, um, from the onset of the class, one of the things I had said that once after Paul's conversion from being Saul, the persecutor of the saints, to becoming Paul and, and dealing with the Jews, once he got barriers on his assignment, he, he did the thing that was given to him to do. And now he's telling his young understudy, I know my assignment. I've mm. done everything. I finished my course. 
You know, I've done what I was supposed to do. I kept the faith. I fought a good fight. And everything that I did was in my assignment. Mm. See, that's the thing we want to have said, when our time on earth is no more. And I said it's not just to ministry, but to every one of us. What is your assignment? Yeah. What is your assignment? You have an assignment. Well, I'm not a preacher. Didn't say you were a preacher. But wow. you have an assignment. And if you don't do your assignment, you're not going to be able to say what Paul said, that I did these things. You know, your assignment may not be the, in the pulpit preacher. Your assignment may not be the things that Paul did, but you have an assignment. And if you don't finish your assignment, what's going to be said about you? He was a good guy. Mm. That's all they're going to say. He's a good person. Good, you know, do anything for you. But, but was that the assignment given? Wow. You know, work your assignment. Your assignment may never be inside these four walls, but you have an assignment. Man. I heard Brother John say when y'all couldn't hear everything he was saying when we first started, that he was on his job. And he kept talking to this man about Christ, about Christ. And the man said, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> right? Stop talking to me. But it must have been his assignment because guess what? You said, but three years later, like that, the man called you 11 o'clock one night and said, I accepted Christ. Right. What they're saying? Well, John, I don't want the rest of your assignment, but that part you passed. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Your assignment. Right. You know, the assignment came with persecution. Mm. You know, he got, he got this guy telling him, man, shut up. I don't want to hear it. But he said, I know this is my assignment. I got to get this man to understand. That wasn't inside of a church. Mm. You know, that was not um, in a church setting. So we have assignment. We don't follow through with our assignment because wow. we, we, we hide behind the fact that we're not preachers. Wow. Apostle, I, you know, those are such great closing words. I know we got some comments. I, I love the point that you made. Follow through on our assignment. I made that note. I think that's so important. I see uh, Deacon Fain said, be instant in proclaiming Christ, both in season, out of season. Be instant when it's convenient, as well as when it's not convenient. And then uh, Brother Rash Minister Rashawn says, hey, Apostle, great closing words. We got. I see we've got a hand. Uh, Brother Victor, Sister Monica, go right ahead, and we're going to wrap this up and get into the hands of our superintendent. Uh, go right ahead. Yes, sir. Uh I just, I just wanted to share that uh, I had to repent on some scriptures that I read uh, concerning Paul because Paul fought a good fight before he got on that road to Damascus. And when he was going to Ananias to be uh, uh, given his sight back, Ananias was complaining. He says, you don't know how many suffering I got for him to do. You go and do this. So, so, so in other words, I was thinking that Paul deserved all the persecution that he got for what he did before he went on that road to Damascus. And so I was being judgmental, so I had to, I had to repent for that because that was none of my business. That was God's business, you know. But Paul was terrible. So Paul, Paul fought a good fight before he went on that road to Damascus. Then he fought a good fight after that. I just wanted to share that. But he fought Amen. a good fight, fight for a different purpose. That's right. That's right. He was a fighter. Yeah, he, he was, was a fighter. fighter. Yeah, he was a fighter. Yes, sir. Hey, man, I'll close with this. Sister Stephanie Christmas put something in the chat. She said, moving forward. Uh, and that's one of the things I, I do when I finish up emails. I simply say, keep moving forward. Uh, I'll share this and I'll get it over to Sister Charmaine. I looked at a message this week uh, from the Duke. It was a Duke woman's basketball coach. If you get a chance to look at look at it, just go on to Google and put in how to handle handling hard better. And she says this message so profoundly. She says, you know what? If you're waiting for it to get easy, it's not going to get easy. You just got to learn to handle hard better because that's what life is about. My great grandmother mother used to say life is hard and it's not fair. But we can learn to handle hard better because at the reality, the scripture says he will never leave us nor forsake us. So with that, thank you so much for your continued engagement. And I'm going to put it into the hands 
of our superintendent, Sister Charmaine White. God bless you. Amen. We do thank the Lord for the Sabbath school today. Thank God for the nuggets that we learned today in his word and and for get, receiving um, some instructions on how to keep moving forward. So I don't want to mess it up. I want us to, to meditate on the things that we've heard. And I trust that you have been encouraged. I know that you have. The Lord has visited us in this Sabbath school. And whenever his presence come in, he comes in to bless so we thank God for that. And we're going to close out the Sabbath school. Thank you for attending. Thank you. As I said earlier, um, when I opened up, you chose to be a part of our Sabbath school. And thank you for that. So we close it out. And Apostle, the service is now in your hands. Thank you, Sister Charmaine. I just want to say to all of you that are in attendance today, we thank you, those that have joined us by Facebook Live or by Zoom, and even you that are here in the audience and the saints begin to come in. And I want to say that um, to Deacon Preston, thank you for a great job as, sister, as, sister, as superintendent. Thank you and for the teachers of the earlier class. I know we had one substitute this morning, brother. Uh, sister Tangi uh, substituted for class number one. We thank her. And uh, Deacon Rotten is back uh, from vacation, so we thank him for being with us. I don't know why, but when I was looking on on Facebook Live for some of the comments, there was a uh, Mency, was it Chris? Who was it? I, I lost the screen, so that name. You all see it? Who is it? I don't know. I mean, not, not who it is, but the name. Are you saying Teresa? No. Missy? No. no? Trista, right? Trista Mency. I don't know who Trist Trista Mency is. But let me just say this, um, I, and I don't need to know, um, but let me do this right quick. Uh, I don't know who you are. I don't know. I may even know you personally, just don't know you by that name uh, or maybe do name association. But let me just pray for you. All right. Gracious Father, we, as we were in Sabbath school, this person, Tristan Missy, came up, and I don't know who it is. But I'm led to, to ask you to bless them, ask you to, to keep the individual, ask you to, to take care of Lord. Whatever's going through, whatever you um, have to face, we ask, Lord, that you open doors for, for, and make ways and just be a blessing. And any way that the individual need to be blessed, we know, Lord, you can do that. And all the blessings in your name we pray. Amen. All right. I um, want to say... Uh, again, be back with us at 1 o'clock for Sabbath school, and we thank God for you being here today. Uh, I mean, be back at 1 o'clock for our afternoon worship. Some of the saints are already in Kentucky. Normally, um, our, our services will start Monday, activities start tomorrow. A lot of the saints uh, will be in Lexington today um, because of for the opening of the um, um before the convention, and some are there now, some are on their way. Saints are traveling from all over the world to be here. Saints coming from Africa, Jamaica, um, England, and just different places. And all of us, all of us who are traveling locally, we want the blessing of the Lord to be upon all of all of us as we travel. So we ask God for His traveling mercies. May the Lord watch between me and thee as as we um, leave one another. Bless and keep us, Lord, until the next time. Always bless Jesus' name we pray. Amen.